Hey, what's up guys? So today I'm going to do something a little different than my usual deck videos and gameplay videos of Magic. Um, so I've been playing a lot of Magic and been thinking about it a lot and um, how I can improve as a player and things like that. So this video today um, is kind of like a tip slash tricks sort of video where um, I'll kind of uh, briefly talk about some aspects of the games to try to help you as the player to be a bit better at the game uh, some things to think about when you're um, building your deck or um, during just you know when you're, you're actually playing a game some stuff to think about um, while you're playing a game and hopefully it will help um, now I'm not the greatest magic player ever and I haven't really um, you know won anything major or anything like that to even prove myself or even any such titles so you know it's T uh, take it these tips as as it is and uh, um, it's just kind of like my own personal opinions and uh, you know my own ex personal experience um, playing the game so it's like anecdotal evidence and stuff like that so you know not everything I say is gonna be true not everything I say is gonna be like um, you know uh, the rule of law or anything like that so I these these tips and what I talk about just, just hopefully you know something for you to think about um, you know something I I think about when I I play the game or when I build my deck. So just kind of relaying my knowledge to those that are interested, and you know hopefully it helps. So um, we're gonna kind of start off with just how to think about the game in general. Well, think about any game really. So the entirety of Magic can kind of be broken down into like three main aspects of the game. Uh, the first being, don't mind my my crappy illustrations here, but the first being knowing the rules of the game. Now the rules to Magic is just very complicated. You'll never always know every single rule in the game. It's it's very hard. Um, but knowing what you can and cannot do, um, and some interactions that are important, especially card interaction if it has to do with your deck, um, timing stuff like that when to do this when to do that that's all that's all pretty important so just knowing the rules you'll you'll get better with knowing the rules as you play the game it's just how it is when you first start out any game you're just not going to be that good um, knowing the rules and interactions and stuff like that but the more you play the more um you'll build up your your knowledge of the rules and it becomes a lot easier over time so i you know if you're a new player i i wouldn't really worry about too much about rules in terms of like um, everything that's out there there's just a lot you know there's a whole textbook on rules so don't worry about it too much but definitely um, at least know uh, the, some of the basic game mechanics that's very important um, but you know some of the more fringe stuff I wouldn't worry about too much um, the next thing um, is basically playing your deck so you know you, you gotta build your deck you have to have an idea of what your deck is gonna do have an idea of um, what your deck's uh, end game is going to be or what its early game is going to be um, kind of like th different phases of the game and that's more of a a complicated topic like different phases of the game you know like mid game late game you know end game it's kind of like chess in that sense you know if you, you pay attention to chess or you follow chess they, they have all different theories about the different state of the game um, and similar to that um, same with magic you know um, it's important to keep in mind where, uh, what part of the game you're in and uh, what you're trying to do in that particular part of the game. So knowing how to play your deck, um, building your deck um, the way that you um, think it should be built, just keep in mind that um, when you pilot your deck, that's something you're going to have to pay attention to. You're going to have to see how it's it feels. So, you know, there's like... You know Tron, where they focus on like the late game, where they're dropping big stuff. Early game, they're you know building up their mana base, stuff like that. So knowing how your your deck is gonna run is very important. That just takes a lot of practice, takes a lot of deck um, building and and experimentation and stuff like that. My only real recommendation here is just yeah, just keep playing your deck a lot. You know, even if you lose a lot with your deck, that's fine. Um, that's the whole point about it. Is is losing is an opportunity to learn. Uh, from your mistakes or to see where certain aspects of your deck is weak and then you can kind of make changes and improve on that um, aspect 
Um, the one thing I definitely don't recommend is is you know building new decks every time. That's the one thing that a lot of new players, a lot of um, even some experienced players, um, that's the one thing that they kind of fall into like a pit hole. They'll play their deck and if it doesn't perform super well or they get frustrated with it, they'll just scrap the entire deck altogether. And that might be okay if you're playing like a free to play game like Magic Arena or something like that when you're not really spending um, you know, a lot of physical resources to acquire some stuff. Maybe some people will spend some money on the game. For the most part, um, you would be spending your time. So time is still still a physical resource that you have to manage. Um, you know, time um, acquiring the cards or time playing the deck. Something that's something you have to keep in mind about um, when you when you play the game is how you use your time and um, what you're gonna do with your time. And for me, if I spent my time losing with the deck, that's a lot. It offers me a lot of uh, opportunities to learn um, about my own mistake and about my um, my own play style and stuff like that, and what I should do and what I shouldn't do with the deck and, and stuff like that. You know, uh, for an example, like I, I built the uh, Reanimator Esper deck um, about a week or two ago. You know, first couple of games were rough. I was still learning the the hoops and loops of the deck. Um, you know, trying out different cards, seeing what worked. And you know, I'm at the point where I'm pretty confident with the deck, and you know, like like best of one, because I played enough with the deck, I lost enough with it, I won enough with it, and I kind of have a feel and, and a general take on how I want to move the deck, um, and how um, what I want to see the deck do in the early st states of the game and later state of the game. So that's that's just something um, that comes with just playing your deck a lot. Um, the next and probably uh, the least important thing of the three is knowing what your your opponent's deck does. Now, I say least important um, because there are just so many decks out there. You're not, you're never gonna, always going to know what you're up against and what your opponent's strategy is. Yeah, if you play against Lotus deck, you know, pretty simple. It's um, you know, pretty straightforward as what their deck is trying to do, or like a mid-range deck. But there are some little fringe decks or combo decks that uh, will catch you blindsided, like rogue decks and stuff like that. And so you're not always going to know how to play against that deck or you're not always gonna um, be prepared for it but it's still an important aspect of the game um, to kind of at least have an idea of what your um, opponent's deck does there's plenty of games or uh, plenty of matches I've gone into where I have absolutely no idea what my opponent's deck does you know I'm, I'm fairly new to to modern um, you know I've been playing for less than like six months and I have only uh, you know played at a few locos you know like that are around me and there's obviously a million other decks um you know online and um around you know and every time i approach a new deck um you know i being a control player obviously it's a little bit easier because i'm just kind of waiting for my opponent to react but the difficult part about that is knowing when i should at react and when i should not uh, react you know um or like if you're playing a mid-range deck more or less you're going to kind of ignore what your opponent does and just you know, focus on your gameplay. So there's just a few things to keep in mind there when you're playing against a new deck or playing against something you're not familiar with is you have to know what your deck is also doing. So like if you're a control deck, you can you know hang back a little bit, observe your opponent, see what they're doing, learn their deck, and then tutor your strategy around that. If you don't know what your opponent's really doing or you have a purpose in your deck, if you're a combo deck or... Um, you know, you're, you're a mid-range deck, you're just going to try to focus in developing your own strategy and apply pressure, uh, you know, uh, be that aggro, be that aggressive, and force your opponent to react to you rather than reacting their, uh, to their deck. So that's something to think about there, um, playing Magic, whether you're going to be re uh, proactive or more of a reactive. Naturally, if you're playing control, you're going to be more reactive, but not saying that you can't be proactive if you're playing a control deck you know vice versa with a mid-range deck or uh, a combo deck or something else so yeah th that's how i look at the game um that's how a lot of the games um you know boil down to um when playing uh, magic in general so um let's go ahead and move on more of a big uh more of a deep dive into well i guess not a deep dive but more to talk about when it comes to um playing i guess control in general uh, since I, I mainly play control, uh, both, you know, online and offline, and um, I, I've done that for, like, uh, you know, when I play, like, other card games like Yu-Gi-Oh! or um, 
when I used to play like Vanguard or even like Digimon. I play a lot of card games, and oftentimes I um, tend to tutor or tend to move towards con uh, a controlling style of deck, which means I'm kind of more reactive. Um, with you know, if I am proactive with my control deck, I'm forcing my opponent to do certain things to answer my deck. But most of the time, I like to observe my deck and then or observe my opponent and make like a a counter attack or something like that to disrupt their strategy. So, um, the way um, you want to think about control here is there are essentially five state of control. There's five things you gotta pay attention to when you're playing um, the game. Whether it could be, it doesn't have to necessarily be control, but just in general, like this, these uh, right here is some some stuff I I thought up. Now, obviously, it's not probably not that original. You know, it's um, someone's probably already um, I thought up about this sort of thing so i have no idea if you know there's an article or something else if uh, has anyone ever else talk about it but um in my mind this is how i break down um being sort of like a um, a control player in, in some sense and i kind of list it from like in my opinion from the most important to the least important um but they're all in retrospect very important to the game plan anyways so we'll kind of just briefly hopefully talk about it explain to you what um what they are what you're trying to do some strategies you can do and um, i'll kind of go over my deck too a little bit um, just to kind of show you uh, some of the things i thought about when i was designing my deck to um you know play and do well you know at events and stuff like that and like i mentioned before um part of the game is knowing how to Play the, you know the game with rules never half is know how to pilot your own deck so that you know you don't uh so your deck doesn't bite you in your, your own butt you know because that does happen a lot like i've seen people uh build their deck and they pilot pilot the deck incorrectly and it kind of bites them in the butt so you just want to avoid that like you you want to make sure you you're not too greedy with like certain things or you're you know you're, you're uh making your deck kind of like lopsided and not like um balanced you know that's that's kind of kind of a, a hard uh, a hard um, line to to kind of balance there so the first uh, part is going to be board so board is pretty easy it's whatever is on the battlefield it's whatever is on the board right now so whether it's creatures uh, artifacts um, enchantments stuff like that uh, if you're playing control you your main focus is obviously to manage what's on the board whether it's to manage your own stuff or manage your opponents um, permanence or whatever you want to have enough ability like enough um um you want to have enough interaction with the board so that that being the most important aspect of the game um is just managing that board because that board will either win you the game or lose the game you know if you're playing against an aggro deck you don't control the board you're going to lose to their creatures if you're playing um you know a um uh, an enchantment you know combo deck or something like that and you don't deal with their enchantments and you don't have any way to interact with their enchantments it, um that's all something that that will, will kind of lose you the game so board um pretty pretty self-explanatory uh card selections and choices like this would be like board wipes spot removal you know stuff like that just um make sure if you're building your control deck to have some sort of board interaction you don't want to let your opponent just build up their army build up their resource and their board and just not do anything uh, to interrupt that or to remove that um, second thing here is going to be the hand so the hand here uh, it's always pretty uh, you know you're going to manage your own hand resource and you're going to have to manage your opponent's hand resources oftentimes when i'm playing a game i will ask how many cards my opponent has so reason why I do that is like I can see if I can make a certain trade if it will be beneficial to me to me making a trade for maybe one card for one or I can make a trade two for one you know something like that if you can choke your opponent out of their hand out of their resources their board state might be a little bit weaker maybe they'll they won't be able to play as many creatures or they may not be able to play um, something to back up their creatures or to protect their creatures whatever you want to make sure you always keep in mind your opponent's hand and your hand and then um kind of control that um some pretty um pretty self-explanatory hand control cards would be something like a thought seize or maybe a counter spell 
you know, something like that. That's typically how you control your opponent's hand is by using those methods or like a discard spell or something like that. Um, another example would be something like uh, Chow's the Void. You know, Chow's the Void. It's a very good card at controlling your opponent's hand or even your hand. You know, like you have to be careful with when playing uh, Chow's the Void. So that's something to, to kind of keep in mind and to um, be sure you... Um, if you're playing control, that you have some control over your opponent's hand and the board state. Those are the two main things that you definitely want to um, keep track of. Now, the oftentimes forgotten, uh, I guess, third brother of the three main ones of the physical things you can see and interact with. Like these three are like the physical things. You know, it's com comes down to physical card advantage and physical things. So the these is something that you can interact with usually um, you can kind of see and oftentimes the graveyard is forgotten so a lot of people um, will build their deck they'll build a sideboard um, they'll be very weak on graveyard removal they'll put maybe four or five maybe you know four more like two to four cards to uh, to deal with the graveyard now uh, the graveyard itself oftentimes it, there's unless their deck is like a re deck most of the time you don't have to worry about the graveyard which is very true you know it's a place where things go to die they won't come back same thing with the exile pile you know the, um if it's exiled you you probably won't ever have to worry about it again but the graveyard is not a part of um the uh, control experience where you can't really um uh can't you can't really um you can't really I'm trying to find that word here. You can't really be too lenient about, I guess. Um, so if you've seen my decks, like the way I build is I, I oftentimes obviously favor these two, especially in my main deck and the way I build a deck, because you know, these two, if you can control these two, you'll win most most matchups. And, you know, and then there's the third part where I'm kinda light on, on my main deck. You know, I'm not, I'm not really trying to control my opponent's graveyard in the main deck as much. But when it comes to sideboarding, if I feel like my opponent uses this grave, I will definitely control this more than I control anything else. And I'll, I'll kind of explain that and uh, why sometimes the graveyard can absolutely be more important to control than whether it's the board or the hand. So if in today's modern metagame, a lot of decks you see, they will play some sort of variation of a Lurus deck or a, some sort of reanimator deck. Now, those cards don't have much value in the hand sometimes um or the board um because sometimes they require to be synergetic with their graveyard so like a tormagoyf a darcy or maybe a bauble or even a loris they for them to get value and for them to generate value they they really would need their graveyard to work with now if you can deny them their graveyard you can choke them out of resources They'll quickly run out of resources because the cards that they are playing aren't going to really generate a lot of resources on their own without their graveyard to synergize with it. Something like a like a Darcy, for example. She's a 1-1. One, one. Without her graveyard, um, no, she's just a 1-1. One, one, you know? She's not much of a threat. Same thing with Tormogoyf. If they don't have anything in the graveyard, it's a 0-1, you know, for example. Now, that's assuming you have something like Rest in Peace, then. Or, yeah rest in peace or something it's it makes their cards in their hands a lot worse makes their board state a lot worse so if you choke out their graveyard you choke out uh their course strategy then you can make their board state worse that you can make their cards in their hands a lot less valuable like you know unholy heat for example it becomes a lot less value when it's only two damage versus six damage because they have no graveyard left so in that respect um me as control player i recognize that i when I play against those type of decks, I will always attack their graveyard first before I attack anything else. Um, you know, I'd rather not spend two mana to counter a Tormogorf. I'd rather spend three mana or, you know, two mana to get rid of their graveyard. Let them cast their Tormogorf. Let them have nothing useful to do with their Tormogorf. That's how I look at it, and that's how I, I tend to play the game, is by attacking the one resource they don't think people are going to attack. Um, and most of the time, um, you know, People will try to attack it. They'll they'll play like 
a, a relic of progenesis, they'll activate it once they think that's enough. That's really not enough because decks like a Lurus deck or a Murktide deck or a, a Phoenix deck or a, a, a Esper Reanimator deck, they can quickly rebuild their graveyard. And you getting rid of it one time and thinking that's enough, that really isn't. You know, they... Their, their entire strategy is to get value off their graveyard. They can easily rebuild their graveyard really quickly. Same thing with my uh, animator Reesper deck in um, Historic. Um, people will play like an ooze or something, get rid of one threat, and then my turn I dump like three or four more things into the graveyard. Maybe maybe even half my deck into the graveyard, and I'll have a new one by um, you know up and ready to pump out some threats onto the board. And so that's something you want to um, pay attention to, is that this is the least looked part about control and if you're a control player to build a good control deck you gotta make sure you have some form of interaction with all three of these right here and those are the main things so um the problem with blue white control from what i've noticed and what i played against or what i've seen is they definitely lack the graveyard control oftentimes they'll play something like maybe um a rest in peace and call it a day or maybe a sanctifier or a relic or maybe if they are feeling ballsies they'll do four ley line of the void and hopefully start off with ley line of the void but oftentimes that's kind of half-ass measure it's not always going to work and um they'll lose to um their opponent's board state if they don't get control of the graveyard now yes they can do like um a child's the void or something like that to kind of control the the hand but you know chalice of the void is not invincible sure if you have chalice of the void and you can protect it with counter spells you can have some sort of you know way to maybe play another chalice then yeah you might be able to, to squeeze out the game and choke your opponent out of the game based off that card alone but often that time that strategy to rely on that one particular card can oftentimes um, backfire they get like they abrupt decay where you can't counter it you can't Will interact with it your chalice is gone it turns all their cards back on and they just only need one turn to develop their board develop their grave and then take you out of the game and you're going to be really behind so that's the one thing that um you have to be you have to think about when you're building your control deck is to not rely on one card to win you the game um you know you can't really rely on rest in peace all the time you can't re rely on chalice of the board you can't rely on the solitudes you know, Teferi to win you the game. Yes, those are very powerful cards, without a doubt, and they can win you the game. But you shouldn't um, purely rely on that to, um, you know, push you ahead and closing out, you know, the game from there with just the, you know, the one or two cards of those type. Like, I'm not saying that they're not powerful. They definitely are. But you want to have some sort of backup plan. You want to make sure uh, you're redundant with some of your removal, you know. Um, you have some want to have some sort of redundancy or a backup plan or another way to attack and choke out your opponent some more. Uh, that sounds kind of weird, but th that's the the entire idea of, of controlling is by maintaining th these three aspects of the game. You can definitely make it so that your opponent, whatever they do, they they aren't going to be able to recover, and you know you should be able to win from there. You can have even just one attacker on the board. If you can keep one attacker on the board, you can uh, clock them down can beat them at their own game kind of thing and yeah that's basically how i feel like if you're gonna build a control deck um you should kind of think about these things now the last two things here are more or less imaginary they they aren't resources that you can physically interact with so you know they don't really have any um any like true value to the game in sense um you know but they are a resource that you do have to manage and so um, let us let me talk about it. So the first one is going to be like your life total. Now, as a control player, you just need one life to win. Or any game, actually, or any kind of deck. You just need one life to win. Which is very, very true. So that's why, you know, cards that just heal you life aren't going to win your game. But cards that, um, you know, as long as you have one life, you'll still win the game. Managing life, it comes down to managing your own life and your opponent's life. So... Uh, why it's important to manage your opponent's life too is because of the last thing in your time. Um, being a control player, um, without me digressing too much, time is going to be very important. I'll talk about that in a second here. But life, um, a, lot, a lot of people say uh, life is a resource, which is very true. Um, 
you can take hits, you can be risky, and just use your life as a way to um, try to generate temple, try to uh, use your life to even uh, contribute to the to one of these aspects. Excuse me, there. Um, use your life to contribute to one of these aspects in in the in the control. So you know if you're playing something like a thought sees, it's fine. You can lose your two life. You'll hit their hand. You know, or you use um, you know shock lands or or whatever. Don't be afraid. Um, you only need the one life, but you also want to manage it. You know, you want to make sure you are above like you know the three life threshold if you're playing against a red deck, so you don't get bolt to the face and die. Or if you have some way to protect it, you know that's fine. Um, so you know, it this is generally on the bottom. It's only really uh, higher up if you're playing against something like a uh, a burn deck. Then obviously burn deck, um, you want to really put this high up somewhere. You know, you want to put it up maybe even even the, the most number one thing you want to manage is is your life, because you know burn burn players they're not attacking your board, they're not really attacking your hand or your grave, they are attacking your life. So. That's something you want to uh, think about is um, when you're playing a game, you want to know what your opponent's deck is doing and what they're aiming to, to, to target. You know, burn decks target this thing. A control deck will maybe target your hand or board. Or, you know, a mid-range deck is definitely just going to be board state, you know. So think about that. So, um, yeah, life. Um, you you might want most controls and most decks aren't gonna have any way to recover your life. It's because it's not super duper important, but it is nice. You know, it is nice to have some life gain. So you know, most control decks will play like a solitude to kind of gain some life back. Um, you know, with life link, which is great. You know, like um, most of the time, uh, cards that give you life aren't really worth playing. But you know, solitude or like Kai's Guile, those are definitely great cards to gain you some additional resources. Uh, to use here and so um, yeah th think about that when you're you're kind of building your deck it's definitely on the lower priority um, if you don't have any way to re regen your life I wouldn't really worry about it too much it, you just have to focus on on um, maintaining it then during the uh, the game state or during when you're playing the last thing is going to be time so time here is very important as I learn as a control player um, you often go into time, so that that's one thing you want to avoid. Because oftentimes, if you go into time, you are gonna either end up drawing or losing. You're never gonna really win in time um, as a control player, unless you're already got a developed board state and your opponent has nothing. You know, time when time is called, or you run out of time, that's that's where you don't want to be. So, um, you ha to manage time properly, you have to be very deliberate about your plays, plan ahead. Definitely plan ahead. Like you, a lot of people, they will tunnel vision if they have a counter spell. They'll just tunnel vision down the one thing, and they'll just counter whatever your opponent does, and um, that's all they spent their time doing. You don't want to do that because if you, sure, your opponent's not gonna be able to play any cards, but you are also not developing anything on your board. You're not developing any threats. You're not really developing any way to win you the game outside of you know playing your big control cards later, and but that takes time. Like you know a Teferi. A five mana to fairy takes time to win. A Jace takes time, uh, a lot of time to win, um, and so that eats into this resource right here, and that's a very important resource. This is the one resource you cannot get back. You can always gain health. You can always get more card advantage. You can always get more more you know cards on the board and you know, stuff in the, in the grave, but you can never buy more time. Um, and it sounds a little cheesy. I know, but it's the one resource you, you have to manage that's always going to be finite. You, you know, I've seen decks that go infinite life and still lose. You know, it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> like, if you have some way to win, um, you know, infinite life ain't, it's not going to help you win the game. If you can't, you know, push your opponents and can't kill, like, you know, their planeswalker or something like that, that's going to uh, lose you the game. It doesn't really matter. But this this right here will, will can decide whether you, you move on or you just stuck you know in the draw um so managing time can do one of two things either you can manage your time to um you know put threats on the board maybe you know in my deck for example i tend to put tokens out on the board to kind of pressure my opponent a little bit chip away at their life um it doesn't seem too much you know like every every turn i'm doing maybe two to three damage it's not that much but it is clocking them and it is eating their time um both um, in the game and um, the overall um, 
scheme of things. So time can be split into two things. So you can time time. Uh, let me kind of rephrase. Yeah, it's time can definitely be split into two different like categories. Time of the clock. So you know you usually have what forty minutes, forty five minutes, fifty minutes to play the game. So that's finite. The other thing is time in terms of how many turns you get in the game. Uh, I don't mean how many turns in terms of like, oh, you know, time is called, you have five turns to finish your game. Turns in terms of like, how fast can you clock your opponent? If you have like a 10-10 that's hitting for 10 damage each turn, your opponent, you're giving your opponent two turns to, to react or to, you know, win or whatever at that point, you know, because... Because these two are kind of coordinated, you know. Um, if you think about, uh, it's like life plus like turn count, I guess life or or turn. Because if you can clock your opponent, you can uh, make sure that they are gonna be in. Um, you know, they have to be more proactive than less reactive. Uh, you know that sort of thing. So that's something you have to manage, um, and that you want to avoid getting into turns because turns. Like I mentioned, as a control player, you aren't gonna really win unless you have something like like a man land, like a, um, a storm of the hollow giants or something that can hit for big numbers. Most of the time, you're not gonna be able to deal like 15 to 10 damage in a span of uh, five turns. So, yeah, um, time is something you want to definitely think about when playing control. Definitely something you want to maintain when playing um, a game in general, whether you're playing control or you're playing a mid-range deck or whatever it's true for any game that you play especially like you know in um in chess you know for example you know you have a chess timer you know time is very important in management uh to manage in in chess time could be number one right here it can almost be number one um if you're playing chess for example uh in magic obviously it's most games will finish before the time is up but being in control oftentimes you're, you're going to be dragging out um the game state um, to try to win and the other aspect when I'm talking about turns is um, you want to give yourself a lot of time too so control takes a lot of turns in order to stabilize uh, once you're able to stabilize you're going to use those turns to try to win because you want to buy yourself time you want to buy yourself time with some life gain maybe some board wipes to kind of buy more time for yourself uh, in terms of turns so that you can develop your board develop your threats like a teferi or like a, a giant shark or something like that and then you can start clocking your opponent so that's something to uh, keep in mind and to um, try to manage when playing the game and I know it's definitely hard to manage this because when you're in, when you're in the game you oftentimes aren't going to be looking at the clock you oftentimes aren't going to kind of focus on your game but it is important to get a sense of time too when how much time has passed when you do your move um, you know, you don't want to spend 20 minutes thinking about, oh, if I'm just going to pass my turn and do nothing, or I'm just going to hold up a counter spell. You want to be deliberate with your move. Um, when you make a move, just accept it, plan ahead. When your opponent's doing their, uh, doing their play, you want to be planning your turn during your opponent's turn. Um, and that's how you, uh, kind of, um, be good with time. Like, Sometimes I see people, they'll just watch their opponents, but they won't really think about their turn. Like, when I'm playing, um, I'm watching my opponent, I'm seeing what they're doing, I'm paying attention to what they're doing, what the strategy is. But I'm also thinking about ahead, about my turn, and the turn after that even. It, um, looking at my mana, seeing, oh, if I have enough mana to cast a spell, or maybe if I draw a land next turn, I'll do something different. Or if I don't draw a land, I'm going to do this. Or, you know, kind of plan your turns a few turns ahead, um, for sure. Like, that's something you want to manage and want, something you want to be good at. Um, and it's very important to to manage that right there. But, you know, of all this, um, of all these aspects, I would say it's the least important. But, I mean, they're all equally important um, in the all overall grand scheme of things. So, let me go ahead and jump over to my deck and um, talk about it a little bit. In terms of, like, an example um, of how... I build to kind of, um, you know, uh, manage these these uh, important uh, these aspects of the game here. So this is just my my um, my tap out. I use tap out because I usually use it for EDH, so I'm kind of used to it. So you know, ignore that. So basically, um, in terms of like you know managing the board, um, for example, I have stuff like a bunch of removal. Um, you know. 
this interacts with anything this interacts with you know creatures so you want to have some form of removal and some form of instant speed, instant speed removal and, and um you know got fatal pushes uh solitudes but um you know kai's guile so i have you know a fair amount of removal um uh, spot removal and because i have so much spot removal i'm able to not need that much board wipes because board wipes are very expensive to play my strategy here is to play efficient cheap removal to maintain the board state so that's the idea there is if my opponent's casting a um a ragged van or a lures i want to be using like a fatal push or something to kill it worst comes to worst i use a kaya's guile to kill it but you know it's still cheaper than spending four to five mana to you know cast a uh, supreme verdict or an overload dam for example you're still saving on some mana you might still lose out on a little bit of mana tempo but that's fine don't don't worry about it as long as you can maintain the board um you know you're good with that so that's that's some cards i play to maintain the board second thing is hand obviously i used to play um you know thought seizes i have them down here somewhere you know thought distortion uh thought seizes um inquisition i used to do that but um i you know i i, I kind of moved away from from that and i'm you know just kind of focused on using counter spell to manage what they play from their hand um and cannot kind of manage it that way um i'm not really playing any you know challenge the voids or anything like that um or chalice you know chalice the void or chalice uh um the other chalice um so that's uh yeah chalice the void or uh what, what's the other chalice um void mirror yeah yeah void void mirror or chalice the void I'm not really using those um, because I, I think I already have enough ability to manage both the board and the um, and the hand with just the, the cards I'm playing here. Um, so like the reason why Archmage Charm is so good is because you can manage two things. You can manage your opponent's hand, you can manage the board a little bit, and you can also manage your own hand. So that's that's why Chalice the Voids or uh, Archmage Charm is so good. It, it plays into all three aspects. Um, you know, Counterspell is limited to just the hand. Um, similar to to, uh, to Archmage Charm would be uh, Cryptic Command, but unfortunately Cryptic Command is pretty expensive, so you have to you have to know when to use it, and when to not use it, you know, uh, as an example. And um, same thing, you know, the Deluge is for your own hand. Uh, you know, all the the Jaces and the Planeswalkers to kind of manage both the board and your own hand. So they all kind of serve. Most of the cards are flexible. Um, so that's one thing you want to build your deck. Um, when you're when you're playing it, you just want to make it flexible. You're not going to be able to win every single matchup. You know that's not the idea of control. You're not going to be able to beat every single game that you go into. There's there's just some matches that your deck is going to be more inherently weak against. That's fine. Uh, if you try to make a deck that tries tries to beat everything, um, then you'll you'll kind of um, be um, more prone to losing. But you want to make your deck flexible so it seems kind of counterintuitive you want to be both flexible but you also don't want to be like including a bunch of cards that answer you know every single aspect of the <laughs> of the game that don't contribute or don't synergize with your, with your own deck or your own strategy like so for example like i choose to play esper because of like i like splashing kai's guile now kai's guile has a bunch of different modes and they all manage a different type of resource you know you can sack a creature manage your opponent's resource you can exile the graveyard, manages another resource there, and you make your own token. You can progress your own your own game state by making a one-one token, or if you're in danger of dying, you can heal yourself up. So that's why Kaya's Guile is great. It it's a good control card. It uh, manages a bunch of different resources. You pick and choose which one you need at the time. It's never it's never really dead. If your opponent's not playing any any creatures or anything like that, you can use it to advance your own board state or your own life, you know, etc. So um in terms of designing my deck i chose to play two because i in the game one most decks aren't going to be um too focused on the graveyard and um so i decided to okay i, I probably only need two copies because i can always recycle them with snapcasters for example and so i you know i opt to play two um and then uh manage the graveyard a little bit less but that's what the cyborg is for so when you run into something that is a, a heavy graveyard deck then yeah you want to be siding in your kayas your extra kayas uh sanctifiers rest in peace to kind of choke them out of their game uh game state and uh, or game plan 
as I mentioned earlier. So that's something to keep in mind in how you design uh, both your main deck and your sideboard deck, uh, especially when it comes to uh, control. This is this is how I kind of made it, and um, the deck is very re reactive. Most of the time, we're not going to be really doing anything. Most of the time, we're just going to focus early game to fix our colors, to draw cards that we need to see, to draw a potential counter spell and removal. And basically all these cards are to help us speed through our decks to get the stuff that we need. Um, because it, as a control player, oftentimes you don't want to mulligan because uh, the resource war is very important. If you mulligan, you're going to be down resources, but it happens. You know, you, it's fine. Like, it will happen that you'll you'll take time to mulligan um, and it, that can't be helped. But if you're mulliganing, make sure you, you have cards that are um, early in the game that can be played in the um, opening um, part of the game. Most games, you know, your the early game is turn one, turn two, turn three. Some games, even uh, some decks, still make the turn three or even your turn two the late game. You know, like Hammer Time or Tron can put you on the clock um, really early. And if you don't have any sort of interaction in your hand or stuff like that, then definitely you know you want to consider mulliganing to make sure you get the cards that you can use to interact with your opponent especially as a control player um so that's something you, you gotta have to to manage and think about when you're playing the game um you know for me um for example like i like using kai's guile because it manages the two last resources that are oftentimes ignored which is life and uh time so the way i manage time is by putting on um, tokens and stuff like that to kind of pressure my opponent a little bit, kind of nudge them, you know, just let let them know that I you know, I am going after their life total. I am going to win uh, by depleting their life if they're not careful. Oftentimes they think uh, about control. They aren't really thinking about their life because they, you know, like me, I'm not really thinking about my life either. I'll ignore it if they're my if my opponent's playing something and they're smacking me in the face with it, unless it's, it's a ragaran or something that demands an immediate answer, I'll kind of ignore it until it becomes a, a problem. Um, same thing with the Kaya tokens, uh, for example, or maybe Snapcasters. They're really small, they're fairly weak, um, they don't really pose much of a threat, but overall, uh, in the in the uh, the game, because of a control, um, being controlled, we're trying to buy time uh, for us uh, to stabilize and we're also trying to clock our opponents and limit their time um, and so we're if you're managing both of that correctly you should be able to beat your opponent before physical time has ran out now if physical time has ran out then you're out of luck you're, in, you're probably not going to win there but if you can buy yourself time turns in the game and um, subtract turns from your opponent then that's where you want to be headed you want to apply a bit of pressure you are not fully an, an aggro deck, but you, you do want to hit their one resource that most people are going to ignore, which is their health. So um, that's one way to chunk away at, at that one particular resource. And obviously all the removals to hit the board resource, you know, counter spells to hit the hand resource. And, you know, um, Kai's Guile to hit the graveyard resource. So that's how I've, I've um, designed my particular deck here. It's to kind of manage a bit of everything um, so like I mentioned that uh, you, you want to design your deck to like so I can fight everything or do everything perfectly you know that's really hard it's to try to make your deck that does everything like a jack of all trades master of none um, that's kind of hard to um, design and perfect you know but if you can um, design your deck around the turns too that's also something you can do so like I designed my deck to be sort of a, a mid-range deck uh, well not really mid-range but an early game deck because i have you know a bunch of really cheap removal a couple of really cheap counter spells moving into the late mid game like these are the cards i want to see really early as soon as possible so there's there is theory to that there is a um a, a thought into that so i have something to do with my early early games like some control decks when they play they don't do anything turn one they don't do anything turn two and turn three they're, they're just playing land passing land passing obviously that's something you want to kind of avoid if you can because that's really slow you want to be somewhat proactive uh, reactive but also be a little bit proactive so kind of find a balance between that um is really good so like um, I, i'll come back to it again like kaya's kyle is both a proactive card and a reactive card it's a two for one card that's you know really good like if they play a creature you can react to it by 
exiling their, uh, or sacrificing their creature and then making a token. So let's see, uh, as you can kind of see there, that's why the, um, this card is so good. Um, you know, not to you know, not to tune it any more than, than I already have, but um, that's something that you want to think about. Now, uh, in terms of like um, the rest of my side deck, for example, like if I'm playing against a Titan deck, I'm going to try to out temple them. I'm going to try to try to put a little bit of pressure with like the Arvin uh, Mind Sensor, and if they cast a Titan or something, I'm going to try to make them you know lose their temple by spinning the Titan back to the top of their deck most of the time, and then just continue to apply a bit of pressure to their health and uh, have them try to react to it or have them try to put up a defense. Um, so that's that's the other thing is being a control player does not mean you cannot be on the offensive. Oftentimes what I see when people play control, they make the mistake of always just sitting back and doing nothing. And that doesn't win you the game. That will put you into time and then you'll lose in time. You know, to, so when you're playing control, make sure you're very... Um, when you feel like you can start to apply pressure start to be the aggressor oftentimes uh, people are not prepared for a an aggressive control um and you know that's why mental uh mentor uh is it uh, the, uh monastery mentor was so good because you know people will side that in they'll they'll play the uh the mentor and then starts applying pressure as soon as possible so you know that that's an example as to you know why um you know, you can catch your point off guard a little bit if they're, they know you're playing control, but you're being the aggressor. You're attacking them in the, for, you know, in the air where they can't block, or you're making them use, like, removal on your really cheap cards. Like, people will use removal, like, solitudes on my Kaya tokens. They'll use solitudes on Snapcasters, you know, Fury, you know, whatever. Like, they'll, they'll use stuff to try to get rid of my threats, which is fine. I can always make them again. Um, they are... Um, they are something, or um, if they get rid of all this, then I have like something as a, like a backup, like my man lands, for example, that I can apply pressure with, and they are hard to interact with, you know. So those are kind of like some theories you can look around into, um, different ways to approach building the deck, um, especially um, I know playing control is not the easiest thing. It's not the most fun thing either. For, you know, for me, I I like controlling the pace of the game. I like being able to deny a point, my opponent resources, and that's just the the style I play but obviously control is not for everyone but regardless if you play control or mid-range I think um, some of these basic principles that I, I mentioned earlier you know all of this can be applied to any deck that you do play you know um, well, or when it comes to um, designing your deck you know if you're just if you're playing burn you definitely want to hit this you know you want to uh, be able to take out their life and um, you know uh, win that way or if you're playing like a mid-range deck or whatever some some stuff to think about um when you're uh, building your deck and this is applicable to every everything that's um uh, in the game you know um so yeah so that's kind of like my 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 spiel my my uh thoughts on on how to to uh kind of play the game um how to what to think about it when you're kind of designing your decks or when to when you're actually playing the game you know those those are also two different things, though. Know? Making your deck, um, designing your deck is one thing. You know, some people they like to take a list off of the internet or whatever or neck deck and play the the deck, and I that's fine. I mean, there's nothing wrong with net decking a deck, especially if you see it's doing well, it's doing great. But that's also a pitfall. A lot of people will net deck, but they won't understand the, the idea or design behind the deck or know how to pilot pilot it efficiently. See, the thing is like. When you're building a deck from bottom up and you're play testing it a lot you you are tutoring your your you're tuning your deck and you're understanding its weaknesses and its strength you know um if you're copying else um copying someone else's deck that's fine but you want to if you're going to do that you want to make sure you get in a lot of reputation uh, reps in with the deck you know you want to be very repetitive to the deck you want to play the deck a lot and to understand the idea or the design behind the deck what the creator was trying to do with the deck and that's how you would play well with a deck you know you, you can't just copy a deck and expect to do well with it um now that's a, a huge pitfall there like you can't copy my deck go to the tournament expect to do well with it without understanding uh, what my idea behind the deck was or how i'm how i play the deck or you yourself as a player you know um you know me as a player i'm, I'm very patient i'm very observant but if you're someone who's a little bit more aggressive who wants to you know get the get in as soon as possible 
you know, obviously my deck's not for you. It, and if you try to apply my deck, you may play it incorrectly because you, know, you might be casting stuff really aggressively or, you know, doing something like that. So that's just something you want to think about too when um, building a deck is if you're going to um, a net deck or copy a deck or something like that, just just be sure you know how to pilot the deck. Like I am not guilty free of that. Like I, I have taken people's deck, you know, copied it and I played their deck. And I see how their deck works, if whether I like it or not, or like I take out some cards or I gut some stuff, rebuild the deck, or even scrap the entire deck altogether, you know. But like, it's good to um, do that. Also, it's it's good to play other people's deck so that when you do see it, when you when you do play against it, you understand how the deck works, just like understanding your opponent's deck, you know. Um, back when I used to play a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh, I would go on to online simulators stuff like that that were free i'll build random decks that i'll copy off other people and just play it myself to see how the deck runs to understand what the deck is trying to do and um get a feel for it in magic it's a little bit harder there's not many ways to get kind of like a free thing i know there's like cockatrice and a few other programs you can probably use to build decks and just to test them out or to proxy you know um but that's that's something else you can you can also do to be to become a, an overall better player is by playing different decks or just observing how other people um play decks like i i myself watch people on youtube all the time i'll watch people on twitch uh, you know they'll play certain decks i'll watch how they play the deck understand their mindset and what they're doing how they approach playing the deck and understand their decision making or how um i would pilot the deck if i were to play it you know and um, what choices i would make instead of their choices when they're playing the deck, you know. So that's that's all kind of like just tips, uh, you know, especially as a new player or even as a uh, moderate player like me. I'm, I'm like in the middle of the pack. I'm like not bad at the game, but I'm not like a, you know, a grandmaster. I don't, I don't think I would be able to go to Vegas tomorrow and win Vegas, you know. that's I don't have that kind of uh, skill level yet, you know. But even then, I, I definitely... Um, want to go out i want to play uh, as much as uh, get as many games as i in um, as i can and that's um you know kind of like a real life um time management thing too so you want to manage your time in real life you know i got work you know i work and i you know want to go after work to play a couple of games and stuff so i manage my time so that i can afford to do that um and so that's something else you can um uh, definitely want to pay attention to you know it's just managing your own time in real life and time in, in the game i guess so th that's kind of like a, a different topic for another time same thing with um you know i mentioned earlier about boards uh the state of the game now i don't really understand all this the, the parts of the state of the game you know like you know early game mid game and end game like i i don't think i can speak about that topic i'm not definitely um familiar enough to to talk about what you should be doing the those, those part of the games it, you know, I have an idea when I build my own deck what I want to do during those during those part of the games, but I don't know what's the correct decision sometimes to, to do those the um to do during those uh state um those part of the game. So that's something I'm trying to improve on my own um, by playing uh against other people. I want to observe what they're doing, and then I want to reflect on what I should be doing during those early parts of the game or during those late parts of the game, and kind of change my deck. A little bit based on that like for example um i talked about um adding like you know man lands to to my deck because i i have observed myself getting to the late part of the game where i'm not really able to apply pressure anymore if i ran out of resources or ran out of tokens or ran out of snapcasters or something like that i want another way to just you know put a big number on the board and try to close out the game and, and that's why i've included like something like a celestial and a hall of giants to, to kind of accelerate that late part of the game where I struggle a lot. Um, yeah, I, I might have a five minute to ferry out on board, but he's not going to win me the game in the next couple of turns. And, you know, if you're if you're playing on time, um, you know, um, you, you got to make sure you don't get to that point. Um, or if you are in that time, you know, hero um, ulting a Teferi isn't going to win you the game. So you, ha you have to make sure you have another way to kind of close out the game um, or you know come from behind it or even steal a game if you're if your opponent's like a two health and they swing everything at you and they don't kill you you know you can come out of nowhere and just you know steal the game uh, with one card or something like that so uh, i think um that's basically all i got for today um it's quite a long video again but i think um, those are just some things to kind of pay attention to 
uh, when you're playing the game, when you're deck building. Um, and overall, you can kind of apply these ideas to, to really any game that you play. Um, and, you know, I, I come from a background of just playing a lot of video games. I play a lot of card games, um, you know, stuff like that. And, um, you know, each each of those um, things have their own, like, I guess, meta. And so you you gotta, you kind of have to know um, that meta and know that, um, you know, the, the stuff that's going on in there kind of at a loss of words <laughs> what I'm trying to, to describe here. But before I go off on another tangent, um, yeah. So let me know what you guys think, if this video was going to be helpful or not. I know it's a long video. Maybe some people enjoy the long talk or, uh, or whatever. Um, if you think they're bad or if you think I should talk about something else or you think, you know, whatever you want to discuss, just let me know um, and uh, or post a comment or, you know, message me and, uh, yeah, we can talk it out. Or um, um, if you need some help with certain things or whatnot, I I'll, I'll can, you know, try to give you some advice there. Anyways, I uh, hope, hope this helps and uh, we'll see you guys next time.